Emerging from the mists of time, the land was a dark and mysterious place. A place known as part of Ultima Thule, at the end of the earth. The peoples of this unknown land, eventually in 844 AD, became one kingdom through common faith and common danger. This new kingdom, called Alba, gradually extended its borders southwards, and in 1018 AD, this newborn nation was welded together under the leadership of King Malcolm II and became known as Scotland. Glasgow, Scotland's most populated city, once the epitome of an industrial town, has now turned full circle to be a foremost centre for the arts. Glasgow has much to offer the discerning with its cathedral, public squares, and museums. Though perhaps more than anything, it is the people themselves, with their unique social culture shaped from the hard industrial past, that makes the warm generosity of Glasgow and the Glaswegian renowned throughout the world. It was here in Ayrshire, which lies to the southwest of Glasgow, in the small village of Alloway, that on the 25th of January 1759, the man who was to become Scotland's national bard and most celebrated poet was born, Robert Burns. The tiny thatched cottage where he was born and spent his formative years now acts as a museum to his memory. His varied life as a farmer, an exciseman, a romantic and a great socializer inspired many of his famous works. Sir Walter Scott once said of the Eildon Hills, from atop I can see 43 places of war and verse. Scott, the Wizard of the North, was already a celebrated author when he bought a farmhouse called Clartyhole on the banks of the River Tweed. And there he began work on his Waverley novels, stories of adventure and romance. The books brought him such fame and fortune that in 1820 he rebuilt the farmhouse in pseudo-monastic, pseudo-baronial style and called his new house Abbotsford. Eastwards, within the shadow of the Lomond Hills, is Castle Island, set in the center of Loch Leven. Mary, Queen of Scots, was held captive within its gray walls for 11 months, between 1567 and 68. The Queen, however, made a daring escape with the help of young Willie Douglas, a friend of the jailer's son. When the Queen was safely away, Willie Douglas, showing his defiance, threw the keys of the castle into the dark waters of the loch. On around the coast of Fife Ness, we arrive at St Andrews, the home of golf. And in 1754, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club was born. The Royal and Ancient took over the running of the Open and Amateur Championship in 1919, and is, with common consent, the ruling authority on golf throughout most of the world. Glam's Castle, seat of the Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. Glam's was also the childhood home of the present Queen Mother and the birthplace of the present-day Princess Margaret, born within the castle in 1930, the first royal princess to be born in Scotland for over 300 years. The hydroelectric dam across the river provides vibrant electric power to the town and the surrounding area. Up this disgorged water torrent, the wild salmon fight their way up the Tay and the Tamil to this concrete barrier. But man in his wisdom has created a watery staircase to allow the noble fish to pass the dam and reach the spawning grounds in the mountain burns. Pass of Killicranky, the scene of a bloody battle between the Scots and the government forces of General Mackay. 
The battle was won in the Jacobite cause by Graham of Cleverhouse, Bonnie Dundee. Sadly, he was killed in his moment of victory. Nearby, in all its glory, sits Blair Castle, amidst the rolling foothills of its 135,000-acre estate, home to his grace, the Duke of Athol. The castle in its present state was largely rebuilt with monies received from the British government in return for sovereignty over the Isle of Man. On this visit, we are lucky enough to witness the parading of the famous Athol Highlanders, the only surviving private army in Europe, officially recognized by Queen Victoria in 1844 and still mustered to this very day. The castle and its estates also plays annual host to probably Scotland's most famous event, the Highland Games. These events bring locals and visitors alike together in one glorious day of sport, dance and music, pageant and revelry. Events are featured like throwing the stain, highland dancing, and sword dancing. And of course, tossing the caber. They make a day at these gatherings, a memory never to be forgotten. And although competition and pride run fiercely throughout every event, nothing ever stands in the way of comradeship at these the most friendly of games. But now we travel westwards along the Caledonian Canal to Loch Ness, where since the beginning of recorded history, there has been a legend relating to encounters with the Loch Ness monster since St. Columba on his journey through the Highlands was said to have saved a Pict from being consumed in the year 565 AD, and also that the water horse had towed his boat across the waters of the Ness, and therefore was granted perpetual freedom. Throughout history, there have been numerous stories told of this monster, thought, through description, to be a reptile-type creature that resembles a plesiosaurus, a Jurassic marine reptile. Monsters apart, the loch sits astride the geological fault and is over 24 miles long, the longest in Great Britain, and reaches depths of over 750 feet. The impressive ruin sitting above the loch is that of an old Clan Grant stronghold, Urquhart Castle, one of the largest fortresses in Scotland. A few miles to the east stands the statue of the kilted Highlander, looking down Loch Shiel at Glen Finnan to commemorate the raising of the standard at the beginning of Prince Charles Edward Stuart's campaign, which sadly ended in the same area in which it started, on the bonny banks of Loch Lomond. The Queen of Scottish Lochs is the largest inland waterway in Great Britain and stretches from Ardlui in the north to Barrach in the south. The wooded hills to the northeast rise dramatically into the lofty peaks of Ben Lomond and Ben Vrachy, standing like sentinels, guarding their precious queen. Sitting high upon its crag above the river, Stirling Castle, with impregnable fortifications, commands complete security over all it views. The castle and its town is steeped in the history of battles and plunder. Sir William Wallace defeated the English in 1297 at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Later, he was gallantly followed into the history books by King Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. From Stirling Castle's ramparts, we look down the Forth Valley, past the Wallace Monument, and onward. On past the islands of Inchcombe with its priory, Inchmickery, 
and Inchkeith. We approach the port of Leith, the gateway from the sea into Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. Edinburgh is unsurpassed in what it has to offer. A city of half a million inhabitants, it has crammed within its boundaries a multitude of venues in which any visitor can indulge himself. From its old town, built on the backbone of a volcanic crag, to its new town, stretching towards the shores of the Forth. From the ancient castle, high on its rocky outcrop, down its narrow royal mile to the palace of Holyrood. Past historic buildings full of exhibits and into hostelries filled with locals and tourists alike. This short tour of Scotland intends to give a general insight as well as fond memories of this proud and beautiful country. With a past full of history and romance, and the present well-equipped, Scotland will always give the visitor the best that its people and its heritage has to offer. <laughs>